Wonderful. Thank you so, so much for uh, attending uh, after the coffee. We'll give you a 15-minute tour of Runeuron. Here's a disclaimer. We're a public company in the UK. Uh, and here's a quick overview. I thought it was a very good panel uh, right before the coffee break. And uh, you know, one, one of the things I'm very happy about is to work in uh, cell therapy and allogeneic cell therapy. Um, because allogeneic means you have the opportunity to drive the cost of goods down to a proper pharmaceutical level, which means 10% or less cost of goods. Uh, and uh, very, very hard to do that uh, in an autologous setting. So I'm happy to be there. Uh, I know on the autologous side it will be solved. It's just going to take some time. Uh, but yeah, a little bit easier to be on the allogeneic side of things. Um, we, uh, you can see the pipeline here. We have two different platforms. One is um, uh, CTX, uh, which is a neural cell, and the other one is HRPC, which is a retinal cell. Um, the CTX program, we are in uh, the disabilities following from a stroke, um, and also in CLI, and we derive exosomes from the manufacturing there. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the third leg of the CTX side. Uh, for the retinal program, uh, we are in phase one uh, in retinitis pigmentosa. So we'll come back to that. So these are the two cell lines. I think the, uh, the, the difference here, the uh, CTX cell line is immortalized. So that means we never need to go back and re-derive these cells. Uh, we're able to go through uh, many passages. We can make millions and millions of patient doses without ever having to go back. Uh, and that's uh, due to gene technology that we've used uh, in order to be able to go that far with those cells. So every single cell here is a clone, um, and that will always be the same one. Um, for HRPC, that's a typical, uh, more typical uh, cell culture where we actually go back and re-derive every so often. Uh, we're a well-backed company. We're well-funded. Uh, we have, as you can see, a good list of investors uh, behind us. Um, we, we're well-funded. We have 66 million British pesos uh, in the bank, so it used to be a lot, but they are getting less by the day. Uh, but still, uh, most of our cost is here, so it's all right. Um, our cash runway goes into late 2018 uh, with uh, assuming every program will go ahead with full speed, uh, which is obviously what we always assume. We have a full management team uh, to implement a very ambitious program. And I'd like to go into CTX cell product first. This is Randolph Kortling, our head of research, uh, and it's smart to wear thick gloves when you're holding something at minus 135 degrees. And uh, that's the CTX cell there. Uh, yeah, so it's cryopreserved, and that was the point of the previous picture. Um, when we did our phase one trial, we had an uh, eight hour shelf life. And uh, Janet here from Roslyn Cell Therapies, she had to deliver this product very quickly so that we could ship it very fast to Glasgow uh, to get it into patients in that eight hour window. Uh, not an easy way to do clinical trials. Uh, it was possible and we did it. Uh, but now we have a six month shelf life with the cryopreserved product, makes it a little bit uh, easier to do clinical trial in multiple uh, locations. So our first um, indication for CTX uh, is stroke disability. And as soon as you say stroke, people, at least from big pharma, run out of the room. Um, stroke has been a minefield for clinical trials. Uh, and what everyone thinks of a stroke is acute stroke. Um, this is not what we're working on. We're working on chronic stroke. So the consequences of stroke, most patients will survive the stroke. Um, two-thirds of them will have some disabilities resulting from the stroke. Most of that is motor disability. And what we're trying to do is to help uh, solve that problem with motor disability. Uh, it's very far from an orphan indication. This is a huge indication. Uh, stroke is uh, the number one uh, source of adult disability in the Western world. There's no pharmaceutical treatment for chronic stroke. There is something for acute, and that's TPA, and that's the only thing that has been, um, um, uh, has been approved. Maybe Atherosis will have a cell product coming one day as well. That would be great. Uh, but so far, four hours after stroke, that's your only therapeutic window. After that, there is nothing. There is physical rehab, there is uh, speech therapy, uh, no uh, pharmaceutical intervention. And so it's a huge and open market here. 
our phase one trial that I mentioned earlier, uh, we, have, we published that just uh, in August uh, in The Lancet. Uh, so you can have a look at that. It was uh, 11 patients were treated in four different uh, doses. Um, that was two, five, 10, and 20 million cells. These cells are injected uh, straight into the brain, uh, close to where the stroke has happened. So this is local therapy uh, months or years after the stroke has happened. Uh, bottom line for phase one was we saw no adverse event related to the cell therapy. Um, the only adverse event you see is something to do with actually the injection of the cells. We do drill a hole in people's heads, so they might have a headache. There might be some reddening and there might be some bleeding. Uh, but from the cells, there's nothing. We don't use immunosuppressants either. We saw encouraging efficacy results from this study. Um, and based on that, we have gone into a phase two study, uh, which you see here. The phase two study is a single arm study in 21 patients. Um, they're all at the 20 million dose, so we've taken the highest dose from phase one into this study. Um, and we have, uh, there are a number of different measures in stroke. Um, it makes this a little bit difficult because most of them are validated for acute stroke rather than chronic. Um, uh, so we have to adapt to that. Uh, and we're torturing our patients a bit because we actually do test a lot of the different uh, stroke uh, scales on them, so they have to go through quite a lot of measurements. Um, but that will help us going forward so we can pick what is the right thing uh, when we go into pivotal studies. We have finished treating all the 21 patients. We're now waiting for them to hit their three-month data point beyond uh, treatment. Uh, we're cleaning the data. We expect the data to be available the first week of uh, or early December. So that means you should look out for a press release early December on the result of that. Uh, expecting those results to look good um, means we will then go into controlled phase two, three study after that. Uh, control in this uh, context means uh, placebo surgery. Yeah, sounds a bit scary, doesn't it? Um, placebo surgery means uh, that the patient will not know if he or she had um, the uh, therapy or not. Um, the surgeon will actually drill a hole, the patient will be ane uh, under anesthesia, um, and uh, they will wake up with a plaster and a headache, um, but the surgeon on the placebo patients will actually not penetrate the dura, so there is no infection risk. Uh, so that's how it's ethically possible to do that. Uh, we will most probably offer those patients uh, an opportunity to switch to active therapy after the trial has completed. So they will have to wait a couple of years before they have that opportunity. Uh, but that should help us in the recruitment that that opportunity is there. So yeah, we're looking forward to the data from the phase two trial. Uh, and we're working very hard on getting ready for the following trial after that. Um, looking at the time, I probably should skip this second indication. CTX also, we're looking for critical limb ischemia. But in the interest of time, I will skip these two slides and go to our second product, uh, human retinal progenitor cells. The, our, uh, uh, this is a picture from our, our QC lab. Uh, it says low carbon dioxide there. The interesting thing about these cells actually um, is we spent a long time figuring out how to manufacture them. Uh, and in the end, it was ob obvious that uh, we needed to use low oxygen culture in order to make these cells grow. It took us several years to find that obvious answer. Uh, but we have a nice patent for that, um, and uh, it kind of mimics the life in the back of the eye and uh, kind of makes sense in the end. Um, so this is based on a human retinal progenitor cell. Um, our aim here is to regrow lost photoreceptors in patients who are losing their sight. Um, you're grown with all the photoreceptors you'll ever have. You're not going to regrow anyone on your own. So when they're gone, they're gone. Um, and this is uh, what we're trying to do. The, uh, we work with very smart people here. Um, the Foundation Fighting Blindness in the US, which is a big charity, funded some of the uh, preclinical work. Um, uh, we work with Moorfields here in London, uh, and also Skeppens Eye Research Institute, um, which is part of Harvard. Um, and actually, that's where we license the patent. Um, the, the cell itself, we actually developed ourselves, but uh, the patent was sitting there, so we had to license the patent to go forward here. And now we work very, very closely with Skeppens. The first indication we're looking at is uh, retinitis pigmentosa. Um, for us, that's a great indication to look at. It's orphan, but it's a large orphan. 
275,000 patients in the US and Europe combined, so it's a very large indication um, still being orphan. We have orphan drug designation, uh, and we have fast track designation for that product. Um, so uh, this can move quite fast forward. Uh, Spark Therapeutics, we hope and expect them to have the first gene therapy approval in the US uh, with uh, their RPE65 gene therapy, which will treat some of these same patients. Um, their patient population, instead of being 275,000, is uh, 3,500, because the gene, um, there's only one or two percent of the patients who have that gene defect. Uh, RP, um, there's about 100 different genes involved. So I'm happy that we have a gene-free product, so this is cell therapy. Um, and the uh, phase one, two study has started. Um, it was based on this data that you can see here. This, was, this is an IND on one page, so I will skip that, uh, because more importantly than the Royal College um, of Surgeon RAT uh, is patients. So uh, the phase one, two is ongoing right now. Uh, it's a single center study at, uh, uh, in Boston, uh, Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, where the PI is Dr. Eric Pierce, um, who is absolutely wonderful uh, uh, guy to be working with. Um, the, the way the cells are delivered uh, is a subretinal uh, injection. So we detach the retina temporarily, uh, and we put the cells in there. Uh, and and uh, there are two other ports uh, into the eye. One is a light guide so the surgeon can see what he's doing. Uh, and the third one is, uh, is uh, just to equalize the pressure uh, in the eye. Um, it's uh, not something you want me to do, but uh, for a retinal surgeon, this is, um, this is bread and butter. This is what they do all day. Um, this is done in half an hour. Patients can actually go home the same day. Uh, we keep them... Um, not in the hospital, but we keep them in the hotel right next to the hot, uh, ho um, hospital overnight, uh, just so we kind of, in case something happens, so far that's uh, been absolutely fine. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, there are a lot of patients available, uh, so there's a huge list of patients that, are, um, that want to enter the study. Um, every time we treat a patient, we actually have a patient sitting in a waiting room in case the first patient uh, changes his or her mind. So that tells you something about how many patients are available. I mean, we tell them there's basically no chance they're going to be treated, but they still say, no, no, it's fine. Uh, I'll come. So this study is ongoing. Uh, we will have uh, our, um, the first nine patients as a safety part, so the phase one part. Then there's a six patient phase two part after that. Um, they're injected in one eye, uh, and then we measure both, so we're getting some feedback um, on both safety and efficacy all the way through on that study. Um, safety results first half next year, <coughs> efficacy results second half next year. Good, I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, two minutes left. <laughs> Thanks, Bethany. I hope you don't have a hammer that you're going to come with next. The, the exosome platform, you know, I can leave that to the next speaker because Capricor is going to talk about exosomes, I think, uh, as well. Where is Linda? Um, but uh, exosomes are something that you can uh, capture when you produce um, uh, our cells uh, from the media, uh, from the cell media, we can uh, capture these exosomes. Now, they're, they're very, very interesting. Um, they are involved in signaling between cells. So this is the way cells talk to each other. Uh, it's not very long ago when we thought that uh, exosomes was just rubbish being excreted from cells, uh, but biology is always more complicated than we think. So these are actually ways cells try to influence each other. Um, so there are two interesting aspects here. One is to use exosomes as a therapy in itself. Uh, and the second one is to use exosome to, exosome to deliver gene therapy, uh, so as a transport vehicle or delivery vehicle. So we, we're pursuing both of those two things. The, uh, um, w on the therapy side, we have some very interesting data in, in, uh, in cancer, in, in glioblastoma, uh, that we're pursuing. Uh, but what we're spending actually most time here is the, is the last point, uh, which is um, very much about making sure we have the right product, that we have the right process, uh, that we can clean up this product and always have the same exosome coming out of the, out of the media. And we spend a lot of time on that. Uh, and we work here with good uh, people like the Catapult sitting here, uh, also NKI in, in the Netherlands, and uh, UCL Moorfields um, uh, here in, in London. 
The, uh, so these are milestones in the last minute. Uh, the, the key ones to focus on for CTX are stroke phase two data is coming uh, early December. Uh, and then based on that, we uh, plan to start a uh, controlled study in the first half of next year. Uh, and then the second, I think, uh, most important part here is the RP program uh, for uh, HRPC. Uh, safety data first half next year, as I mentioned, and then efficacy data second half next year. And then we go very fast into a registration study. You only need two studies from start to finish in, in that indication. So uh, it is uh, uh, a lot of interesting um, and big milestones coming for us over the next uh, couple of years. In summary, uh, allergenic cell therapy, we've got a strong team to deliver a very ambitious program. Thank you very much. <laughs>